Good evening, one and all, friends, family, and inexplicably present foes. It is currently Monday, June 22nd, the second day of summer of this wild year, 2020. And you can bet pretty much anything you want if you're a gambling man or person, um, or as little as you like. The outcome remains the same, that it is, in fact, bedtime, brother. Welcome, everybody. My name's Colin. I'm Brother Bedtime, and we read stories here for big and little kids. So far in the chat, we've got Mulrick swinging in and saying hello, hi, good to see you. Colleen Frank, welcome to the two of you as well. Marin, thanks for tuning in. Lovely to see you all again, um, at least as much as I can see of you. Your names are so colorful, and they bring me such joy to see them flicker on the screen. We just came out of a, a, a rather girthy weekend as far as, um, you know, uh, events go. We had the summer solstice on, I believe it was Saturday night. Is that correct? Friday night, Saturday night? Um, or was it just yesterday? At any rate, today is something like the second day of summer proper up here in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's, uh, it's living up to its namesake. It's, uh, it's hot. It's very hot. It's so hot I almost didn't turn the fireplace on. But you'll see, I've decided that what few production elements we have here on the show cannot be sacrificed. Um, at least not yet. If I, if I start sweating, then, uh, you know, maybe I'll bust out some orange sticky notes or something. And we can all use the power of imagination to enjoy this little fireside chat. <laughs> Rip our house. Yeah, yeah, sorry, babe. Probably have to take a cold shower or something afterwards because it's already getting pretty steamy in here. Ah, this weekend, uh, aside from the solstice, I um, got to see a dear friend of mine who's moving back to Calgary after many years here in Edmonton, um, as well as a brief rendezvous with some other pals that were having a socially distant gathering um, by the fire. Um, and uh, yeah, Father's Day came and went. I'll probably be seeing my own pop sometime this week, which will be lovely um, for uh, something like a, a barbecue or a bonfire. Fire seems to be a prevalent topic so far in the first few minutes of the show here. Um, Tis the season, I suppose. Um, and uh, just today, I filmed a brief promotional video for Circuit Tree, um, which uh, I think most of the folks here right now in the chat will know of. But um, in case you're watching this video later, Circuit Tree is an online creative writing residency program from the minds that brought you Wordsworth. And we're going to be doing all kinds of workshops during the day. And then in the evening, we're going to be playing games and singing songs and telling stories. And um, yeah, if you are a, uh, a creative mind uh, of that particular disposition, then I strongly encourage you to check it out. Um, you can head to writersguild.ca and under programs and services, there's a little tabaroni that'll tell you all you need to know. Um, yeah, so that's my, that's my plug. That's my plug for my thing that I'm working on. I hope the rest of you had a really lovely weekend as well. I hope Monday was kind to you that this first, you know, getting your toes wet as far as this, this scorching new week is concerned has been uh, pleasant and, and, and gentle and a positive experience on the whole. And in the event that it wasn't, oh my God, Monday, am I right? I'm so glad it's over. And what's more important, now we're all here together so we can chill out together and unwind from the day. Marin Shea says, she's currently trying so hard to put some little cartoons on your own circuitry promo video. Oh, cool. Awesome. I love the, uh, the fusion of, 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 of uh, well, I don't know what, I don't know what the, the phrase is, but the fact that you're trying to, to beef it up with some, uh, some other elements is wild, Marin. That's so cool. I, uh, can't wait to see it. Um, and thanks, Mulrick, again for, for your little promo video. It's a pretty insular little affair here tonight, so I don't mind talking a little bit about it. Um, but yeah, that's exciting. It's coming up. It's really coming up. Um, the two of you can expect some girthy emails from me in the next couple of days. <laughs> Tonight we will be continuing our Narnian journey, our great quest eastward on the Voyage of the Dawn Treader by ya boy Clive Staples Lewis. Last week on our double feature episode, our, uh, our heroes landed on the Island of the Voices, um, which seemed to be oddly civilized. There was a nice treed lane that led up to a um, led up to something of a mansion or a manor. Uh, however, 
they were waylaid by an invisible gaggle of somethings, um, which were pouncing and bounding and, and thumping all over the place. And uh, now we've, oh my God, wow. Friends, we've just had a, <laughs> we've had a, a, a marvel of production um, come down the pipes. And so at the uh, insistence and, and dare I say, request of our dear little friend Sam with bells on we now have a glorious non-heat producing fire <laughs> there we go um, I'll be accepting suggestions below as to how effective you think this is might need to spend some time in the back end um, but there we go God bless Sam with bells on amen put it on the glass the glass isn't so hot. Ow! I don't want to put it on the glass. The table melt. Um, yeah, no, this this needs a minute to cool down. We can put this um, there. There. Fire's burning. Fire's burning. <laughs> uh, at any rate, our, uh, our gaggle of adventurers made their way to the island of the voices and were waylaid whereupon their invisible assailants demanded that young Lucy sneak into the mansion, climb up to the second or third floor or so, make her way down the hallway and into the magician's study and read a spell to make them all reappear. Um, because they, they, they were tired of being... They were tired of looking at each other because they were so ugly, so they turned everybody invisible, and now they've grown tired of that and would like to turn back. Lucy read the book, which was a very cool book, um, as far as magical books go. I think, I think Clyde really outdid himself in its description. And she was sorely tempted a few times to read some of the more powerful magic. Um, I could use some of that powerful magic here. We're going to risk it on the glass. There we are. <laughs> Fire mage bedtime. That's me. Fireball! Ah. At any rate, she was very tempted to read some of the more um, powerful uh, self-serving spells, and she did end up eavesdropping on one of her, quote, weak friends, who was bad-mouthing her behind her back. Um, and now their uh, friendship will presumably never be the same. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what you get for, for reading your friend's phone when they go to the bathroom. It's uh, none of your business. And now, I think it's time to carry on. This evening's beverage is uh, good old-fashioned, sorely fluoridated um, Edmontonian tap water. Here's to you, folks. Save Clément de Lisieux. And so, wherever you are, whatever you've got, wherever you're at, I hope you have the opportunity to relax and enjoy. Chapter 11. The Duffel Puds Made Happy. Oh, I don't like that picture at all. I'll show you later. Lucy followed the great lion. Oh yeah, that's right. Aslan showed up. Aslan is here now. He came along and, and they, they had a, a nice snuggle. And the last thing he said was... Um, but come now, we must meet the master of this house. So they're going to go meet the master of the house. Keeper of the keys. Lucy followed the great lion out into the passage, and at once saw, she saw coming toward them an old man, barefoot, dressed in a red robe. Well, the robe is purple, but I'm pretty close. His white hair was crowned with a chaplet of oak leaves. His beard fell to his girdle and he supported himself with a curiously carved staff. When he saw Aslan, he bowed low and said, Welcome, sir, to the least of your houses. Do you grow weary, Koriakin, of ruling such foolish subjects as I have given you here? No, said the magician. They are very stupid, but there is no real harm in them. I begin to grow rather fond of the creatures. Sometimes, perhaps, I am a little impatient, waiting for the day when they can be governed by wisdom instead of this rough magic. 
all in good time, Koryakin, said Aslan. Yes, all in very good time, sir, was the answer. Do you intend to show yourself to them? Nay, said the lion, with a little half-growl that meant, Lucy thought, the same as a laugh. I should frighten them out of their senses. Many stars will grow old and come to take their rest in islands before your people are ripe for that. And today, before sunset, I must visit Trumpkin the Dwarf, where he sits in the castle of Caer Paravel, counting the days till his master Caspian comes home. I will tell him all your story, Lucy. Do not look so sad. We shall meet again soon. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, what do you call soon? I call all times soon, said Aslan. And instantly he was vanished away, and Lucy was alone with the magician. That's a sick dodge. What, a, what an absolute non-answer. <laughs> hey, what time are you coming over to this, this afternoon? Oh, it'll be afternoon for sure. Thanks for nothing, Aslan. <laughs> Gone, said he. That's the magician. And you and I quite crestfallen. It's always like that. You can't keep him. It's not as if he were a tame lion. And how did you enjoy my book? Parts of it very much indeed, said Lucy. Did you know I was there all the time? Well, of course I knew when I let the duffers make themselves invisible that you would be coming along presently to take the spell off. I wasn't quite sure of the exact day. And I wasn't especially on the watch this morning. You see, they had made me invisible too. And being invisible always makes me so sleepy. <gasps> oh, hey ho. Oh. There, I'm yawning again. Are you hungry? Well, perhaps I am a little, said Lucy. I've no idea what time it is. Come, said the magician. All times may be soon to Aslan. But in my home, all hungry times are one o'clock. He led her down a little passageway, and down the passage... Mm, let me try that one again. He led her a little way down the passage and opened a door. Passing in, Lucy found herself in a pleasant room full of sunlight and flowers. The table was bare when they entered, but it was, of course, a magic table, and at a word from the old man, the tablecloth, silvers, plates, glasses, and food appeared. I hope that is what you would like, said he. I have tried to give you food more like the food of your own land than perhaps you have had lately. It's lovely, said Lucy, and so it was. It was an omelette, piping hot, cold lamb and green peas, a strawberry ice, lemon squash to drink with the meal, and a cup of chocolate to follow. But the magician himself drank only wine and ate only bread. <laughs> Quarantine diet, baby. <laughs> I want to make sure this other picture shows up. Oh yeah, okay, good. And a couple of pages larger than before. More grotesque. Good, good. There was nothing alarming about him, and Lucy and he were soon chatting away like old friends. That's a real sort of sideways compliment, you know. Oh, you should meet this guy. Don't worry, there's absolutely nothing to be alarmed about. Not with this guy. Totally unalarming. <laughs> when will the spell work? asked Lucy. Will the duffers be visible again at once? Oh, yes, they're visible now. But they're probably all asleep still. They always take a rest in the middle of the day. And now that they're visible, are you going to let them off being ugly? Will you make them as they were before? Well, that's a rather delicate question, said the magician. You see, it's only they who think they were so nice to look at before. They say they've been unuglified. They say they've been uglified, but that isn't what I called it. Many people might say the change was for the better. Are they awfully conceited? They are. Or at least, the chief duffer is, and he's taught all the rest to be. They always believe every word he says. 
we'd notice that, said Lucy. Yes, we'd better on, we'd, we'd get on better without him, in a way. Of course, I could turn him into something else, or even put a spell on him that would make them not believe a word he said, but I don't like to do that. It's better for them to admire him than to admire nobody. Don't they admire you? asked Lucy. Oh, not me, said the magician. They wouldn't admire me. What was it you uglified them for? I mean, what they call uglified. Well, they wouldn't do what they were told. Their work is to mind the garden and raise food. Not for me, as they imagine, but for themselves. They wouldn't do it at all if I didn't make them. And of course, for a garden you want water. There is a beautiful spring about half a mile away up the hill, and from that spring there flows a stream which comes right past the garden. All I asked them to do was to take their water from the stream instead of trudging up to the spring with their buckets two to three times a day and tiring themselves out besides spilling half of it on the way back. But they wouldn't see it. In the end, they refused point blank. Are they as stupid as all that? asked Lucy. The magician sighed. You wouldn't believe the troubles I've had with them. A few months ago, they were all for washing up the plates and knives before dinner. They said it saved time afterward. I've caught them planting boiled potatoes to save cooking them when they were dug up. One day, the cat got into the dairy, and twenty of them were at work moving all the milk out. No one thought of moving the cat. But I see you've finished. Let's go and look at the duffers. Now they can be looked at. They went into another room, which was full of polished instruments hard to understand, such as astrolabes, oreries, chronoscopes, posimeters, coriambuses, and theodolins. And here, when they had come to the window, the magician said, There, there are your duffers. I really like that Clive kind of leans into this notion of magician as just a learned man, you know, like uh, one of the most magical things in the world is a telescope. <laughs> Which I guess if you look at some of the old, you know, like, what is it, the Flammarion engraving? Or the Flammarion woodcut? Um... They really were, you know. They, they, they had powers beyond that of the natural. There are your duffers. I don't see anybody, said Lucy. And what are those mushroom things? The things she pointed at were dotted all over the level grass. They were certainly very like mushrooms, but far too big. The stalks about three feet high, and the umbrellas about the same length from edge to edge. When she looked carefully, she noticed, too, that the stalks joined the umbrellas not in the middle, but at one side, which gave them an unbalanced look to them. And there was something, a sort of little bundle, lying on the grass at each foot of the stalk. In fact, the longer she gazed at them, the less like mushrooms they appeared. The umbrella part was not really round as she had thought at first. It was longer than it was broad, and it widened on one end. There were a great many of them, fifty or more. Here we can see some of these strange little mushroomy things, if that is indeed what they are, all scattered in the grass. see oh man we were so close yeah we did it we got the focus there they are there's the duffers the clock struck three instantly a most extraordinary thing happened each of the mushrooms suddenly turned upside down the little bundles which had lain at the bottom of the stalks were heads and bodies the stalks themselves were legs, but not two legs to each body. Each body had a single thick leg right under it, not to one side, like the leg of a one-legged man, and at the end of it a single enormous foot, a broad-toed foot, with the toes curling up a little so that it looked rather like a small canoe. 
she saw in a moment why they had looked like mushrooms. They had been lying flat on their backs, each with its single leg straight up in the air, and its enormous foot spread out above it. She learned afterward that this was their ordinary way of resting, for the foot kept off both rain and sun, and for a monopod to lie under its own foot is almost as good as being in a tent. Oh, the funnies, the funnies, cried Lucy, bursting into laughter. Did you make them like that? Yes, yes, I made the duffers into monopods, said the magician. He too was laughing till the tears ran down his cheeks. <laughs> oh, man. But watch, he added. It was worth watching. Of course, these little one-footed men couldn't walk or run as we do. They got about by jumping, like fleas or frogs, and what jumps they made, as if each big foot were a mass of springs, and with what a bounce they came down. That was what made the thumping noise which had puzzled Lucy yesterday. For now they were all jumping in all directions and calling out to one another, Hey, lads, we're visible again! Visible we are, said one, in the, said one in a tasseled red cap, who was obviously the chief monopod. And what I say is, when chaps are visible, why, they can see one another. Ah, there it is, there it is, chief, cried all the others. There's the point. No one's got a clearer head than you. You couldn't have made it plainer. She caught the old man napping, that little girl did, said the chief monopod. We've beaten him this time. Just what we were going to say ourselves, chimed the chorus. You're going stronger than ever today, chief. Keep it up, keep it up. But do they dare to talk about you like that, said Lucy. They seemed to be so afraid of you yesterday. Don't they know you might be listening? That's one of the funny things about the duffers, said the magician. One minute they talk as if I ran everything and overheard everything and was extremely dangerous. The next moment they think they can take me in by tricks that a baby would see through. Bless them. Will they have to be turned back into their proper shapes? asked Lucy. Oh, I do hope it wouldn't be unkind to leave them as they are. Do they really mind very much? They seem pretty happy. I say, look at that jump. What were they like before? Common little dwarfs, he said. Nothing like so nice as the sort you have in Narnia. It would be a pity to change them back, said Lucy. They're so funny, and they're rather nice. Do you think it would make any difference if I told them that? I'm sure it would, if you could get it into their heads. Will you come with me and try? No, no, you'll get on far better without me. I don't know how I feel about this whole let's keep them in this crazy one-legged form. Y'all can judge for yourself. Here is a, uh, a large um, rendition of what the duffers, quote-unquote, may or may not have looked like. I feel like, stupid as they may be, they deserve a little bit of autonomy, and if they want to be changed back in, it wouldn't really be fair to use one's grown intellect to convince them that they're better off only having one enormous leg underneath them. But it's just so funny. I don't know about that. Thanks awfully for the lunch, said Lucy, and quickly turned away. She ran down the stairs, which she, she had come up so nervously that morning, and cannoned into Edmund at the bottom. All the others were with him waiting, and Lucy's conscience smote her when she saw their anxious faces and realized how long she had forgotten them. It's all right, she shouted. Everything's all right. The magician's a brick. And I've seen him, Aslan. After that, she went from them like the wind and out into the garden. Here the earth was shaking with the jumps and the air was ringing with the shouts of the monopods. Both were redoubled when they caught sight of her. Here she comes, here she comes, they cried. Three cheers for the little girl. Ah, she put it across the old gentleman properly, she did. 
And we're extremely regrettable, said the chief monopod, that we can't give you the pleasure of seeing us as we were before we were uglified, for you wouldn't believe the difference. And that's the truth, for there's no denying we're mortal ugly now, so we won't deceive you. Hey, that we are, chief, that we are, echoed the others, bouncing like so many toy balloons. You've said it, you've said it. <laughs> Crap, I'm late, says McKinnon Lance. Welcome, all the same. To catch you up to speed, um, last week they landed on the Island of the Voices, made their way uh, towards it, but were waylaid by some invisible folks. Lucy went upstairs and read a magical book to take the spell off, and she's just met uh, the magician who was responsible for turning them into these things. Um, whatever they were before, he seems to think that these uh, one-legged monstrosities are an improvement um, upon their previous shape. Which I think was just regular old dwarves. I don't know. Sounds all right to me. Anyways, good to have you. Welcome. Lucy's trying to, to sweet talk them into staying as one-legged freaks for the rest of their lives. I shouldn't put it that badly. They are quite lovable little creatures. Where were we? Ah, uh, yes. But I don't think you are at all. One-legged jesters? Yeah, something like that. That's where the thumping was, all the jumping around. But I don't think you are at all, said Lucy, shouting to make herself heard. I think you look very nice. Here, 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 said the monopods. True for you, Missy. Very nice we look. You couldn't find a handsomer lot. They said this without any surprise and did not seem to notice that they had changed their minds. She's a saying, remarked the chief monopod, as how we looked very nice before we were uglified. True for you, chief, true for you, chanted the others. That's what she says. We heard her ourselves. I did not, bawled Lucy. I said you're very nice now. So she did, so she did, said the chief monopod. Said we were very nice then. Hear em both, hear em both, said the monopods. There's a pair for you. Always right. They couldn't have put it better. But we're just saying, we're saying just the opposite, said Lucy, stamping her foot with impatience. So you are, to be sure, so you are, said the monopods. Nothing like an opposite. Keep it up, both of you. <sighs> I imagine that this is what parliamentary hearings are like. Um, just rabbles of people agreeing with <laughs> agreeing to disagree over and over and over again. You're enough to drive anyone mad, said Lucy, and gave it up. But the monopods seemed perfectly contented, and she decided that on the whole the conversation had been a success. And before everyone went to bed, Yes, says Otterboy, welcome, good to have you. <laughs> uh... Maybe the folks in chat can catch up our dear friend Otterboy. I've just re-explained where we're at um, to our good man McKinnon Lance, who showed up late. So if uh, folks in chat wouldn't mind giving him the Coles notes, that would be a lovely. Hope you're having a good day. And before everyone went to bed that evening, something else happened which made them even more satisfied with their one-legged condition. Caspian and all the Narnians went back as soon as possible to the shore to give their news to Rince and the others on board the Dawn Treader, who were by now very anxious. And, of course, the monopods went with them, bouncing like footballs and agreeing with one another in loud voices till Eustace said, I wish the magician would make them inaudible instead of invisible. He was soon sorry he had spoken, because then he had to explain that an inaudible thing is something you can't hear, and though he took a lot of trouble, he never felt sure that the monopods had really understood. And what especially annoyed him was that in the end they said, Hey, he can't put things the way our chief does, but you'll learn, young man. Hark to him. He'll show you how to say things. There's a speaker for you. When they reached the bay, Reepicheep had a brilliant idea. He had his little coracle lowered and paddled himself about in it till the monopods were thoroughly interested. And then he stood up in it and said, Worthy and, mm, worthy and intelligent monopods, reap a cheap. Sort of a gallant knight, British thing. 
worthy and intelligent monopods. You do not need boats. Each of you has a foot that will do instead. Just jump as lightly as you can on the water and see what happens. The chief monopod hung back and warned the others that they'd find the water powerful wet. But one or two of the younger ones tried it almost at once, and then a few others followed their example, and at last the whole lot did the same. It worked perfectly. The huge single foot of a monopod acted as a natural raft or boat, and when Reepicheep had taught them how to cut rude paddles for themselves, they all paddled about the bay and round the dawn treader, looking for all the world like a fleet of little canoes with a fat dwarf standing up in, ex in the extreme stern of each. And they had races, and bottles of wine were lowered down to them from the ship as prizes, and the sailors stood leaning over the ship's sides and laughed till their own sides ached. <laughs> oh, man. The duffers. Hopping one-legged. Yes. Very good. The duffers were also very pleased with their new name of monopods, which seemed to them a magnificent name, though they never got it right. That's what we are, they bellowed. Money puds, pomenods, potimons, just what it was on the tip of our tongues to call ourselves. But they soon got it mixed up with their old name of duffers, and finally settled down to calling themselves the duffel puds. And that is what they will probably be called for centuries. That evening, all the Narnians dined upstairs with the magician, and Lucy noticed how different the whole top floor looked now that she was no longer afraid of it. The mysterious signs on the doors were still mysterious, but now looked as if they had kind and cheerful meanings, and even the bearded mirror now seemed funny rather than frightening. At dinner, Everyone had by magic what everyone liked best to eat and drink. And after dinner, the magician did a very useful and beautiful piece of magic. He laid two blank sheets of parchment on the table and asked Drinian to give him an exact account of their voyage up to date. And as Drinian spoke, everything he's described came out on the parchment in fine, clear lines, till at last each sheet was a splendid map of the eastern ocean, showing Galma, Terebinthia, the Seven Isles, the Lone Islands, Dragon Island, Burnt Island, Death Water, and the land of the Duffers itself, all exactly the right sizes and in the right positions. They were the first maps ever made of those seas, and better than any that have been made since without magic. For on these, though the towns and mountains looked at first just as they would on an ordinary map. When the magician lent them a magnifying glass, you saw that they were perfect little pictures of the real things, so that you could see the very castle and slave market and streets in Narrowhaven, all very clear, though very distant, like things seen through the wrong end of a telescope. The only drawback was that the coastline of most of the islands was incomplete for the map showed only what Drinian had seen with his own eyes. When they were finished, the magician kept one himself and presented the other to Caspian. It still hangs in his chamber of instruments at Caer Paravel. But the magician could tell them nothing about seas or lands further east. He did, however, tell them that about seven years before, a Narnian ship had put in at his waters, and that she had on board the Lord's Revillian, Argos, Mavramorn, and Roop, so they judged that the golden man they had seen lying in death water must be the Lord Restamar. Next day, the magician magically mended the stern of the dawn treader where it had been damaged by the sea serpent and loaded her with useful gifts. There was a most friendly parting, and when she sailed, two hours after noon, all the duffelpuds paddled out with her to the harbor mouth and cheered until she was out of the sound of their cheering. And that is the end of chapter 11. Fascinating. It's unclear to me why the magician turned them into these one-legged creatures. It's only they who think they were so nice to look at before. They say they've been uglified, but that isn't what I called it. Many people might say the change was for the better. 
I don't know why that would be. Any theories? There's something going on here with like Aslan having appointed this magician to rule over this small group of people until such a time as, you know, they are, uh, um, you know, up to snuff to, to meet Aslan and all of that. But what the heck? Probably for a lark, says McKinnon Lance. Maybe. I mean, I guess, I guess that's it. They just seem to be so extremely funny. So that's got to be it. He just did it for a laugh. And I guess the monopods are not smart enough to to know that it's a kind of a big deal or it could be a big deal. Maybe the monopods have just mastered the art of detachment and are totally cool and always living in the present moment. So they don't mind too much, in fact, um, their strange condition. Nevertheless, my dear friends and fam, that is the end of our story for tonight. We will be back tomorrow with chapter 12 of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader by ya boy, Clyde. And, uh, yeah, I think that's about, that's about it for me. I hope you're all enjoying the story, and thanks again for tuning in. It's always such a lovely way to begin the week and uh, end the first day of the week. It's, it's something that always kind of surprises me when Monday rolls around. Oh, yeah, it's Monday. That means I get to, like, hang out with people and read stories and stuff. What a nice time. Otter boy, yay. Yay. Thanks for the purple heart. I'll put it with the rest. <laughs> good night, moon, and good night, stars. Good night, trucks, and good night, cars. Good night, shoes, and good night, hats. Good night, dogs, and good night, cats. Good night to friends and family. Good night to you, and good night to me. Sweet dreams, everybody. Have a great night's sleep.